Lago Agrio is the center of the oil industry in eastern Ecuador. It's also the epicenter of one of the biggest ecological crimes of all time, the massive contamination of perhaps two million hectares of the Amazon rainforest at the hands of Texaco, which is now part of Chevron. Pablo Fiardo grew up there in extreme poverty and with the help of the Catholic Church put himself through law school. His very first case as a lawyer was the one known throughout South America as Chevron Toxico, a $9.5 billion action on behalf of thousands of indigenous people. Fiardo and his colleagues won, but Chevron skipped the country. So Fiardo's team is asking the courts of Argentina, Brazil and Canada to enforce the Ecuadorian judgment. The Canadian courts have said they'll hear the case, but Chevron is appealing. Back in the USA, meanwhile, Chevron successfully sued Fiardo's American legal colleague, Stephen Donziger, as a racketeer, claiming that he and Fiardo had won in Ecuador by fabrications, fraud, and blackmail. Donziger is also appealing. We interviewed Pablo Fiardo in the very modest house in Lago Agrio, which serves both as his home and his office. This was our first ever green interview in Spanish. By sheer coincidence, we ran into Stephen Donziger at a hotel in Quito, so we interviewed him, too. First, here's Pablo Fiardo. The greater Amazon basin, including Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru, and Ecuador, viewed from the air, is like a giant broccoli of a forest. That is so beautiful, so diverse, so full of life. It contains not only a diversity of plants and animals, but of people, human beings who've lived here their entire lives. For the native peoples who have always lived in the Amazon basin, it's not just their land. It's their supermarket, their pharmacy, their home, the place where they exist in absolute freedom. They lived from and took from the forest only what they needed because they did not want more. They had everything. They had their entire lives. Of course, they had freedom, total freedom. Whenever one talks to the elders of any of the native peoples, whether Sequoia, Kofan, they say that is the most serious thing that the oil industry took from them. They say, now we are not free. Before, we could move freely through the forest, across the rivers, without any problems. Now we are not free. And the whole land was home. The whole terrain was home. Yes, the entire terrain. For example, here, where this city is now, had been ancestral Kofan territory. The Kofans lived in this territory and, of course, were able to hunt and fish and could travel freely. There were several different groups who occupied this area, but they knew their territories and their borders, and they were free to interact with one another, to coexist. And I think I heard hunting and fishing. And that's all lost. That's the big loss from oil. No, it has not been totally lost. There are a few places in the Amazon basin, basically in protected areas, where that life has been somewhat preserved. But not in this zone, where Texaco was active, along with other oil companies. It was all lost. It was lost because once the company came in, in addition to polluting the water, they organized the expulsion of the native peoples occupying the territory, forcing them to move to different areas. And, and also health problems then after that, right? For example, the indigenous people, like the Kofan who lived here, not only enjoyed the freedom to move through the forest and rivers, it's important to understand 
that these peoples lived on what the forest provided. They didn't need to trade on the market because they obtained everything they needed from the forest. Their diet was based on fishing, hunting and gathering fruit. When the oil industry arrived and began contaminating the rivers, the fish began to die off, which resulted in the elimination of the principal food source for the native peoples. They were abruptly removed from their long-standing subsistence economy and were inserted into a violent market economy. So, when we talk about health-related problems, the impact has not just been on physical health. The health of community has been impaired. The disruption to the culture, the way of life, the food, these things affect overall health. So, when industry released toxic chemicals into the environment, new health problems emerged that traditional indigenous healers, shaman, were unable to treat. Shaman, in addition to being important local authorities, had knowledge that could treat common ailments. But when toxic pollution generated new diseases, such as cancer, they were not able to respond. They began to feel increasingly powerless in the face of these new health problems and their inability to treat them. It must also have been very strange that, that the people coming in thought they owned the land as opposed to the land being a place that they lived in. I, I'm not saying that very well, but I'm thinking about the change to property. All of a sudden, Texaco owns land, whereas people had previously just used it. There are many interesting stories. For example, in one Kofan community that was near here, the last shaman, the last leader of that community, named Guillermo Conama, was very wise. When he saw that Texaco was dumping toxic waste into the river, and they lived about three kilometers from here, at the mouth of the Titeye River, Guillermo took his community away to another area to escape. He was very protective of the new territory, insisting that Texaco could not come into it. And he protected the land, even though Texaco wanted to extract oil from it. He adamantly refused to allow the company in. So, the company sent in workers with alcohol to get him drunk. They forced him to drink a lot of alcohol to the point of poisoning and killing him. So, once he dies, the community is left without a leader and the company entered the territory. To make the humiliation worse, the company took Guillermo's wife and forced her to work as a prostitute. She worked as a prostitute for 20 years. An indigenous people without a territory cannot exist. So, they must protect their land. But they didn't exist in the first place legally, right? Because it was industrial land and, and nobody lived there? Well, there are moments. In fact, the Kofan people were the first group to gain territorial recognition from the Ecuadorian state in 1974. Even though the state recognized the land as unclaimed territory, vacant and available. Everybody understood that there were indigenous peoples here, that, that, that they lived here. This was known. The company's operations were criminal and perverse, but the state was an accomplice in these violations of the indigenous people's human rights. 
para que esa violación de los derechos humanos de los pueblos indígenas de una forma tan criminal y perversa como se dio. They're not, these are not mistakes. These are people knowing that they're doing something um, inhuman, uh, unfair, and doing it anyway. Of course they knew. Of course they knew. The company knew what it was doing. It knew it was polluting. Es más, si se pone a revisar la historia, en los años 70, la empresa Texaco tenía las patentes ambientales que se en los años Texaco had filed patents in the United States, which were quite significant. Es decir, tres años antes que Texaco venga a trabajar en Ecuador, se publicó un libro que era el Instituto Americano del Petróleo. Tres años antes de que Texaco venga a extraer oil en Ecuador, they published an industrial handbook that included a chapter on how to extract oil without contaminating water or the environment. It includes lovely illustrations of how to treat the water and re-inject it underground without contaminating and how to treat the gas byproduct. Truly a very important guide of how to conduct oil operations without harming the environment. Notably, the book contained this special chapter on how to extract oil responsibly, which was written by Texaco technicians. Texaco technicians offered training around the world on responsible operations, yet they never applied these techniques in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Why? There are a number of reasons that I see. Three, basically. First, the company had financial incentives. The company was always seeking to earn maximum profit with the minimum investment possible. Second, because of the company's racism, Chevron, and before them Texaco, considered and continue to consider that the indigenous population of the Amazon basin are worth less than any other population throughout the world. And third, the Ecuadorian state's inability to regulate or monitor the operations. Working hand in hand, working together, the state and the, and the company? La complicidad del Estado, si que había en esos años, there was state complicity in those years, but there was also complicity on Chevron's part. There are many documents that I can share with you. In the 1970s and 1980s, when Chevron took over Texaco, there was a report on bribes to Ecuadorian authorities. Chevron, as was typical of large multinationals at the time, was much more powerful than any state. They could set up or take down governments, or at least impose their chosen ministers and regulatory authorities. So, for example, the evidence shows that Chevron bribed regulatory authorities in the Ecuadorian state. So there was complicity of the Ecuadorian state, but the company's bribes purchased that complicity. Now, how did resistance begin? Because you've got, this is, a, this is a criminal corporation, and it'll stop at nothing. So how did, how does, how did the resistance come in this hopeless situation? I think it is a process. My analysis, which is not at all technical, has always been that people unite out of necessity. For example, if you live in a city, in a 50-story building, and you live on the 30th floor, and no one interacts with anyone else, you come and go to your apartment without engaging people above or below or next door to you. But if all of a sudden the electricity or heat or water is cut off in the building, 
no hay servicio de energía eléctrica o no hay calefacción. Then neighbors no start knocking on each other's doors, saying, let's get together to make sure that there is water, services here. So people organize out of necessity. En el caso nuestro, en el caso nuestro, In our case, people had many needs. There are health problems. There is extreme poverty in the population. There are human rights abuses. People suffered abuse and humiliation from Chevron, which had been Texaco, for 20 years, with the company and state together. People did not have any recourse, nowhere to seek assistance, nowhere to seek justice. Faced with this situation, people began to join together and look for a way to demand their rights. In 1987, for example, in this area, along the highway where you came, there was a much rougher road. At that time, it took 12 hours to get here from Quito. There was an earthquake that destroyed the road and destroyed the pipeline. So people here were isolated, cut off from the rest of Ecuador. This made people join together even more to seek a solution to their problems. And we had the support and solidarity of the Catholic Church, which had been working in the area for a long time. So we began to organize and look for solutions. A lot of people from outside the area began to arrive to work with us in those years, like students and doctors, the high incidence of cancer cases began to emerge at this time. There were also increases in miscarriages, childhood leukemia. I became aware of it as well. It began to affect my life. Getting off the bus, and one could immediately see that the roads are all covered in oil because Texaco left the oil there. Everywhere you went, there were hundreds of open wells, like yokaguras, pools of crude oil, animals fallen into the open wells, gas combustion creating an enormous curtain of smoke. It was a catastrophic landscape. Working with the Catholic Church, I went with the priests and the missionaries to visit the communities, and we saw that in every community we went to, the problems were the same. People were sick, women were sick, children were sick, animals were falling into the oil pools, and everyone said the same thing, I'm sick. There are these oil pools, and no one has anywhere to go. At that point, we began to organize a small human rights committee in Shushkin in 1988 to listen to the people. Then we started meeting with groups in Lago Agrio, like organizations of women, indigenous people, youth, rural workers. And, after several years, in 1994, we established the Front to Defend the Amazon to bring our case. So, it was a front. I was young, a high school student, and a little less crazy than I am now, but still a little crazy. There were a lot of people like me back then, and we go together and did a lot of crazy stuff. This is a little of the origins of this social movement that sought respect for life, for nature, and justice. But strong, you were strongly opposed, The right? company was, was uh, resisting everywhere. Of course they did. 
and still do. This isn't just about Texaco Chevron. It's against an entire system of impunity for business that has existed and still exists throughout the world. What's this about? When we started our case, for example, many people told us that we were crazy, that this was impossible. We couldn't win against a big company like Chevron, that these companies dominated the states, that it would be impossible to succeed. And evidently, this was believed around the world, since these large multinationals do what they want, wherever they want. This case of ours poses a serious threat to the systematic impunity for business around the world. It's not that we were against the companies. They have a right to work, to produce. What we oppose is the crimes committed by businesses. If Chevron conducted its operations responsibly, respecting nature and life, it would be different. We are not against these companies, just the way in which they act irresponsibly. But you had to, you had to move from house to house. You were, you, 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 there was so much. I mean, people were out to get you, right? In this, there were many problems. Many problems with security, harassment. We still have these issues, and they keep getting worse. But what's at stake for Chevron is its reputation and a lot of money. For us, the stakes are about life, the lives of our people. When lives are at stake, you keep fighting for justice. Your brother was killed, though. And they thought it was you. This is what we assumed. It's difficult to talk about because these are very upsetting memories. There were efforts at intelligence and an investigation. But in the end, we were unable to determine for certain why he was killed. Yes. I was told that the victim was supposed to be me. I can't know for sure. The reality is that they killed him. It was in the middle of the trial. It was a terrible death. He was cruelly tortured before he died. I'm sorry to, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to cause your pain again. But this is a very tough place. Eh? Easy, to, easy to hire someone to do, um, you know, to kill or beat somebody. Uh, you, you really are, you, ha you have to be both brave and desperate. I live here. I live here. This is my home. I could leave, take my children and go somewhere else. But what happens to the rest of the people who live here? What happens to the indigenous people who have been here all their lives? I try to do my duty to the extent possible by respecting nature, people, life, and so that there is justice. I don't know if I'm brave or cowardly, but I do what I must. Your weapons are words and ideas, huh? Yes. When I took on the leadership of this case, I had been involved since the beginning, but 
took leadership in 2005, I was the only lawyer on the case in Ecuador. The only lawyer. Chevron had 20 lawyers. Yo era el único abogado de este caso aquí en Ecuador, el único abogado. Chevron tenía 20 abogados. Yo tenía un año de experiencia. I had one year of experience practicing law. El abogado más joven de Chevron tenía 25 años. The youngest Chevron lawyer had 25 years experience. Una diferencia tan grande. Such a big difference. Era pues yo solo abogado. They had 20 or 30 expert lawyers, and I was barely out of law school. My advantage is that I don't have to lie. I don't have to figure out the truth, just how to communicate the truth. I am part of the story. The truth is in that story. It's difficult for Chevron. They have to figure out how to lie without making mistakes. Tell me where the case is now. And, and uh, well, tell me where the case is now. There are a lot of different facets to the case. It's so big that it's hard to explain. It's hard to explain, and it's hard for journalists to understand. So they also have a hard time explaining it to their audiences. The principal case in Ecuador, which we won, is in the judgment enforcement phase. But evidently, as you know, during the 20-year long litigation, Chevron liquidated all its assets in Ecuador. So now we have a very good judicial award, a very important legal victory. But Chevron has no assets in Ecuador, so we cannot collect on the judgment in Ecuador. So there are now three cases outside of Ecuador to try to collect on the judgment in Canada, Brazil and Argentina. In the Canadian case, which you know, and which we filed in May 2012, we sought a recognition or approval of the Ecuadorian ruling. In the lower court, the judge did not rule in our favor. That was May 2013. And, of course, we appealed that decision because we believe that the judge misapplied the law. Last December 17, it was, I believe, we received the decision from the Appellate Court in Ontario. It was a formidable decision, super bueno, for human justice and for our case. The case has not ended. It will never be over. But I believe that was an important step, an important blow to Chevron. We have another case in Brazil, filed on 27 July 2012. We believe that in this year, 2014, there will be a decision from Brazil's Supreme Court. Good, bad. We can't know how judges will rule, but we have a lot of confidence and hope because the law is very clear. And if the judges apply the law as it should be, we will win this case. The third case in Argentina is taking a little longer. We had an injunction to seize Chevron's assets, which was overturned, but the underlying case continues. We had an order to freeze Chevron's assets in the Supreme Court of Argentina, but unfortunately, due to pressure from the company and the Argentine government, the Supreme Court withdrew it. But the principal case is ongoing without problems. An important thing about this case is that our commitment and obligation is to pursue Chevron's assets all over the world.
until we collect the last cent of the judgment. This is my promise. We are not going to rest until Chevron pays the very last cent awarded in the judgment. If they, when they pay, the damage is so huge that even that large amount of money is still going to leave you with, with permanent problems. Yes, but first there is another important aspect of the case, which is the RICO case in the United States. This is critical to discuss because of the magnitude. Then I'll answer your question. The RICO case is important. It's important to our case, but it is also important for understanding what Chevron is and what it is capable of doing. It's important to understand that our claim was initiated in 1993 in New York, and it was Chevron that fought and petitioned the New York court to move the case to Ecuador. And after nine years, they were successful. They affirmed in writing that they would be subject to and respect the Ecuadorian legal process. Based on this commitment from Chevron, the New York judges decided to send the case to Ecuador. But then, when we started the case in Ecuador, and with all this evidence, we were able to demonstrate that the evidence clearly supported our case, that Chevron's damages were so real, so obvious, along with the scientific evidence that corroborated our case. Chevron started to attack the Ecuadorian state and attack the entire justice system of Ecuador to discredit the process and supposedly demonstrate that in Ecuador there is no justice. All their pressure on the Ecuadorian state with the lobbying, the arbitrations, functioned as an unrelenting harassment against us, against the victims. In addition to the physical intimidation, my brother's assassination, there was a real, brutal legal terrorism. With the RICO case, for example, in 2012, Chevron actually stated that there was no environmental damage. They claimed that it was an illegal association of indigenous and rural people and their lawyers to create false evidence and to extort money from the company. A conspiracy, exactly. But the damage is here. You can check for yourself. So they hire hundreds of lawyers, convince judges, bribe officials, lawyers. They are undertaking a huge amount of work, spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to undermine this case. And even worse, they create a monster that doesn't exist. According to Chevron's theory, my friend and colleague Stephen Donziger was the mastermind in this case. According to Chevron, Stephen was the one who managed the entire case, and the rest of us were just a bunch of objects. Naturally, they had to do that, portray Stephen as the center of the case, since under the U.S. RICO legislation, if the principal accused or criminal actor isn't American, the law doesn't apply. Chevron thought that by destroying Stephen, they could destroy the case, but they were wrong, because Stephen supports our case works on the case and has done a good job, but he doesn't decide the case. He works for the victims, like us. The victims are the ones who direct the case. We make the decisions. Chevron has unleashed an enormous campaign against Stephen, 
with this RICO charge. It's a show. The important thing is that even when Chevron had Stephen Corral, we kept getting favorable rulings. So at the same time that the RICO action takes place, we get the Canadian decision. We are showing them that he does not manage the case. Only the victims manage the case. Even though we are sure that this judge, Lewis Kaplan, in the RICO case, is going to rule against us because the case can't go any other way, we are convinced first that we will appeal the decision and second that whatever that judge decides is not going to affect the principal case. As I said, the important thing about the RICO case is that it reveals what Chevron is capable of doing to avoid justice, punishment for their crime. Chevron is trying to turn the victims into victimizers. According to Chevron, the company is a victim of our fraud rather than us being the victims of their crimes in the Amazon. Another important front are the arbitrations. Chevron has an arbitration campaign, having brought three arbitrations against the Ecuadorian state in order to supposedly force the state to pay the bill for the crimes committed by Chevron. The RICO case and the arbitrations are two shields made of ice that Chevron has to protect itself. In the summer heat, they will melt away. But you are still not people. You, 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 don't, you have no agency, you're being manipulated by lawyers, you're still not people. It is incredible. During the trial, Chevron's lawyer said to the judge that the Amazon region should be considered a zone for oil industry production and that not a single person should be living in the area. This means that in Chevron's view, the indigenous people who have lived here all their lives are not human beings. Those of us who have been here many more years than Chevron are not human beings. This is part of their racism. The RICO case is another example. Under Chevron's theory, they are the only ones capable of bringing a case like this one. They can't believe that people outside of the United States have been able to bring a case and make a legitimate claim that can win another aspect of Chevron's racism. Even Judge Kaplan, for example, in one of his decisions, refers to the alleged plaintiffs, the alleged victims. He doesn't recognize the existence of the victims, in fact. I'm sure that if the victims, or the plaintiffs in this case against Chevron, had been Spanish, French, German, English or Canadian, Chevron would have paid a while ago, but they're from Ecuador. I think that the most important achievement of this fight is the unity among the peoples. I have been here for 30 years. There are people who have been involved in this fight for 20 years. People like the leaders at Chevron, often political leaders, don't believe that a group of people can come together and take up a cause right. and not be shaken and not fall apart and, and keep on persisting. They, they don't really believe in democracy. If I may, this is extremely important. This action shows that when people get together, it is possible to defeat something that appears invincible. It also shows that no one or no company, however large it is, is untouchable. One last area, which is the question I started before. 
if when this is when this is settled and remediation starts it's a huge task i Donald tells us that there is no drinking water in the entire, what, how many hectares, right? Um, that, that, that the, drinking, the water is contaminated everywhere. How do you deal with that? What do you do? This is important. I believe that Chevron's worst crimes are irreparable. For example, the loss of indigenous cultures. According to our research, in the first five years of Texaco's operations, two separate indigenous groups went extinct. There is no amount of money that can bring back those two cultures. Second, according to data from public health surveys, in recent years, at least 2,000 people died of cancers that can be attributed to toxins in the environment. This is human life. People who died. There is no way that they can be brought back with any amount of money. And when someone dies, suppose it's a woman, it's not just the victim, it's her children and her husband and the whole community that suffer the consequences. This pain can also not be addressed with all the money in the world. The third thing is nature. Ruined rivers, animals, forest. Everything that was destroyed is all impossible to restore. Even if they pay the entire judgment against them, it will fall short of the damage they caused. Yet despite that, we are working on plans for a restoration that is as comprehensive and holistic as possible. The idea is our dream, actually. It's to fix everything that can be fixed in the best way possible, to show Chevron that indigenous and rural people are capable of doing things the right way and are capable of recovering their lives. This case is not about money for anyone. We are not asking for money for any particular person. We are seeking money to clean the soil, the water, the rivers, to fix the problems that the people in the Amazon have been living with for 40 years. Obviously, there is a lot of work, and unfortunately, there is no experience of work on a case this big and complicated anywhere in the world. A case like this does not exist anywhere else. We've researched it, and there is nothing like it. We have to devise the remediation ourselves. And we need the support of the global scientific community to repair the damage and to show the world that this can be done properly. We have been working on these plans for about four years. The plans are how to clean the soil, how to reconstitute the indigenous communities, the culture, the food sources. There is still a lot to do, although a lot of planning has been done. On a weekly basis, we receive invitations from a lot of people from all over the world who want to learn about our case. We are happy to receive them. The big changes in the world will not come from big leaders. 
that will come no from social movements. Vendrán de las luchas sociales como esta. Pablo Fiardo, clearly one of the most remarkable environmental lawyers of our day. Still a young man, he's already won the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize, as well as a Heroes Award from the CNN Television Network. Fiardo's U.S.-based colleague, Stephen Donziger, was a journalist before attending the Harvard Law School, where he played basketball with Barack Obama. He then became a public defender, a legal aid lawyer. And in 1993, he joined the legal team working on the Chevron Toxico case. In the intervening 20 years, he has raised millions of dollars and enlisted the support of powerful law firms and international financiers, some of whom have been bailing out after the courts condemned him under RICO, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act. He's appealing that finding. Business Week summed up his achievement this way. However the confrontation ends, it will have implications far beyond Latin America because Donziger has rewritten the rules for how to sustain far-flung environmental litigation. Here is Stephen Donziker's account of this labyrinthine case. The legal case against Chevron has just this year reached its 20th anniversary. And the reason it's taken so long largely is because Chevron has the primary strategy is that the case never ends. They don't want to pay for a cleanup. And throughout the trial and the what I would call the Ecuador period of the case, which was between 2003 and 2011 from the trial phase. Um, they did everything they possibly could to sabotage you know, our efforts to present proof, to manipulate evidence, to deceive the court, drown the court in frivolous motions. There were just thousands and thousands of repetitive motions they filed. So it, in the period of 2007 when the Vanity Fair article came out to the time of the sentence being issued in 2011 was a brutal time in that we had to fight through massive resistance from Chevron just to get basic stuff done that lawyers take for granted in, you know, a typical situation. Um, you know, so eventually the court decided the issues despite Chevron's, you know, attempts to drown it in paper and paralyze it, and they ruled in favor of the Ecuadorian communities. Um, uh, appropriately so because there was massive and overwhelming scientific and other evidence uh, that showed that Chevron and its predecessor company Texaco adopted a deliberate policy of dumping toxic waste into the Amazon lands and waterways where indigenous groups were living um, over a period of 25 years or so um, and people down there as a result of that dumping are suffering tremendously and lots of cancers, lots of deaths. And this effort, this lawsuit really is nothing other than a movement by indigenous and farmer communities in the affected area to hold this company accountable and get compensation so they can do a clean up and ultimately get justice. Okay, so, so you, you win the case, mm -hmm. you get the judgment, and Chevron has left the building, right? Yes, yeah, Chevron, um, You know, it's important to understand the history of this case. This case started in the United States in 1993. Chevron, or Texaco, I should say, then fought for 10 years in the United States to move it to Ecuador, all the time praising Ecuador's court system as being fair and independent and transparent. The, the Ecuadorians wanted the case in the United States because they wanted it before a jury, and the decisions to pollute in Ecuador had been made in the United States in the New York area where Texaco's headquarters was. Chevron then bought Texaco in 2001, and right after they bought Texaco, they appeared in the U.S. court and said, we want the case in Ecuador. So we have to then shift gears, come down here, hire a whole new legal team, um, and get into a trial that they did everything they possibly could to delay, sabotage, and paralyze. And the whole case took eight years. And as the evidence started to come in during the trial, they realized that they were going to lose the trial. And they immediately tried to make it last forever. And by the time the court finally ruled in the case and ruled in the favor of the communities based on massive evidence that Chevron itself provided of its own wrongdoing and its own policies of dumping and policies to deliberately contaminate the rainforest to save money, once the judgment came, they fled the country. They basically stripped all their assets out of Ecuador and took off and said, we're never going to pay. 
And as a result, there's now what I would call phase three of the Ecuador litigation, which we're now in year 20, which is now requires that the communities pursue Chevron like the fugitive from justice that it is into other countries that have legal systems where they do have enough assets to pay what they owe in Ecuador according to the judgment that was you know, put into place in this country. So now there's lawsuits against Chevron in Canada and Argentina and Brazil and maybe some other countries to come in an effort to force the company to pay what it owes and to hold it accountable under the law. You know, the communities have won the case. It is over. Okay, at this point, it is a matter of making sure Chevron pays what it owes according to the law, and it's really a bunch of c collection actions that are really no different than any typical commercial lawsuit where one party has to pay and they don't, and you have to go find their assets and get their money. What's a shame about it is Chevron is, a, in theory, a reputable public corporation from the United States of America. It's the third largest company in the United States, and it's running from the law, uh, which is why the communities have gone to Canada and these other countries. No point in, bringing in, in taking it back to the states with, with the judgment in hand? That is an option, but you know, the communities have decided um, that they don't trust the court system in the United States. And yeah, because well, there was an action yeah. recently, yeah. right? In which you were yeah. impugned. This exactly. Article. The reason thus far the communities haven't gone to pursue Chevron's assets in the United States are several. But one is um, Chevron gets 75 percent of its revenue from its subsidiaries outside the United States. Chevron is a global company and the Ecuadorians have decided that it is more effective to pursue Chevron's assets outside the United States at this point. And one of the reasons for that is Chevron doesn't play by the rules. Um, they lobby in the United States, they do put on political pressure on courts and governments, and um, they've also launched a lawsuit against everyone involved in the case, including me, Pablo Fajardo, Luis Llanza, two key Ecuadorian leaders of the lawsuit, um, all 47 named rainforest villagers who brought the lawsuit are defendants, um, as well as consultants, and pretty much anybody associated with those of us who have been working on the case for all these years. And Chevron claims that all of us have been involved in what they consider to be a sham litigation, that the whole thing is a fraud and an attempt to extort money from them. And the theory of the case is utterly absurd, yet with all their money, and I think they've spent over a billion US dollars in this case, they have armies of lawyers and investigators and scientists and consultants um, who are trying to show uh, that um, that the Ecuador court system as a whole does not function properly. That is, the court system where they wanted the trial to be held and falls short of standards of international due process. And therefore, any effort to enforce the judgment in these other countries should not be upheld by courts of those countries. Um, but there's simply no trust right now by the Ecuadorian communities in U.S. courts. I mean, the judge that's handling this case has made uh, derogatory comments about the Ecuadorians. Um, has called them the so-called plaintiffs as if they don't exist, um, has said the whole case is not bona fide litigation, has called me a field general, not a real lawyer, um, and it's just been utterly insulting. And I just sat through a seven-week trial and, and there's just nowhere to go. I mean, Chevron sued all of us for literally 60 billion U.S. dollars. I live in a two-bedroom apartment in Manhattan with my wife and son. Um, I am not a man of great means, and for, to be sued for $60 billion, which by the way is the largest potential personal liability in United States history, um, was, I just didn't know what to make of it. I mean, I, it, was, it was so much, it was absurd. Um, Two weeks before trial, the trial was to begin, they dropped all the damages claims against me and Pablo Fajardo and the Ecuadorians because they were scared of a jury. They knew they would lose the case and they wanted this judge who we believe is biased against us to rule alone. But what that ended up doing is it put them in a very difficult legal position where I don't think any decision this judge makes is going to hold up on appeal. And I think ultimately, not only are we going to win what that it's really a retaliatory lawsuit designed to chill our free speech rights. 
not only are we ultimately going to win that, but it's not going to matter that much because the real cases that matter are the enforcement cases in other countries to where judges are going to determine whether um, the system of justice in Ecuador is sufficient to hold this company accountable when it wanted the case to be take place in Ecuador. It doesn't sound like an enviable position for Chevron to argue. No? I think I think Chevron is in an extremely difficult position right now. I think they're facing enormous risk, and I would say their management is almost reckless in the way they're handling this case. Um, you have a nine and a half billion dollar judgment. Um, it's been affirmed by Ecuador's Supreme Court in the forum where Chevron wanted the trial to be held. Chevron has fled the country, stripped its assets from the country, is acting like a fugitive from justice. And everyone who comes down here to see it, and I'm talking now, there's been dozens and dozens of journalists from all over the world who've confirmed the basic facts of the story, which is the company deliberately dumped billions of gallons of toxic waste into the Amazon thinking they could get away with it. And as a result, people are dying down here. Um, indigenous groups are decimated because of this contamination. Um, I don't think Chevron at this point is in an enviable position at all. And I think what Chevron should do is what any responsible company would do, which is obey the law, respect the rule of law, and pay the judgment. You know, by comparison standards, $9.5 billion, I mean, obviously that's a significant amount of money, but compared to the magnitude of what has happened here in Ecuador, it's not. I mean, people in the region call this the Amazon Chernobyl. We believe, based on our research, that it's probably the worst oil-related ecological catastrophe on the planet at the moment. By comparison, the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico from 2010, BP's liability for that spill, which is offshore and has affected far fewer people, as bad as it was, is about $40 billion. In Ecuador, you have a spill that literally affects probably 200,000 people. Not a spill, just contamination that was caused intentionally. That's lasted for almost 50 years. And the liability, according to the court, is $9.5 billion. Chevron makes $250 billion a year, okay? $30 billion a year in profit every year. This case has been going on 20 years. I mean, they've literally made hundreds of billions of dollars in profit over the course of this case, and the court ordered them to pay $9.5 billion to clean up the mess they made. They can easily afford it. I could keep going, but you yeah. probably won't ask me a question. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this is exactly what yeah. I want. It's a yeah. nice, it's a nice yeah. clear account yeah. of what the situation is. So now yeah. you've got a court in Ontario that says they can't run anymore. The, right. We are going to hear the case. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so how do you expect that to unfold? Well, I expect Chevron to do in Canada what it does in every other country where it's under attack by the Ecuadorian communities, which is they're going to try to delay it as much as they can. They pay numerous lawyers in Canada to raise every possible issue to slow down the process. Um, for example, right now they're trying to appeal to the Supreme Court on whether there's jurisdiction over them in Canada, which is utterly absurd as I understand Canadian law because the Supreme Court of Canada already has ruled you can bring these enforcement actions in Canada. Um, and the Supreme Court will presumably just say, no, we're not going to well, do that. Well, you know, right now their Chevron is appealing to the Supreme Court on a preliminary issue, which is whether or not the case can even happen. I think that the Supreme Court of Canada may or may not take that narrow appeal on a, on a technical issue. At some point soon, we hope, there will be a legal action that will be somewhat of a trial for the Court of Canada to determine whether Chevron's defenses, which is that the case was um, the result of a flawed judicial system are valid. I don't think they're valid and I think Chevron will do anything it can to delay that trial for as long as possible and once we're in the trial they'll try to make it as complicated and technical and as long as possible. Um, when it ends, if they lose, they'll appeal and make that as long as possible and as a result we're looking at, at you know, two, three, even four years just in Canada to get to an end game after 20 years, 10 in the United States and 10 in Ecuador. And it's fundamentally not fair. Yeah. You know, it is a fundamental abuse of the legal system by a company that uses its superior resources, and I'm talking billions of dollars, 
to try to throw sand into the gears of the judicial system so it doesn't work properly and they can just kick the can down the road. It is cheaper for Chevron to pay hundreds of lawyers right now in various countries to try to delay this matter than to pay for an actual cleanup. And that's the calculation that they have made. But it's produced enormous risks for them because, you know, they're under enormous pressure from prominent institutional shareholders who believe the current management team has mismanaged the litigation in Ecuador, and I, I believe they have. Chevron's chairman and CEO, a man named John Watson, um, is saying very aggressive things about the lawyers. Like he calls us criminals, for example. I mean, what CEO f has a confirmed $9.5 billion liability talks like that? I mean, how do you get off that limb? Um, it doesn't make sense. It's not responsible management. And I think the current management team of Chevron is on a crusade against lawyers and others they perceive as being a long-term threat to their interests. Because the Ecuador case ultimately is not just about Ecuador in Chevron's eyes. It's about, I believe, a threat to their business model. Because Chevron, and this is not just true for Chevron, but a lot of oil and extractive industry companies, um, has a lot of legacy environmental issues around the world. And I think they're very, very nervous about a precedent being set in this case where indigenous groups with very little resources were able to sustain for all these years a legal action that resulted in a victory. And if, they, if the communities receive the money that they need to clean up this huge area, as they should, I think Chevron is extremely worried that they will be hit with other legal actions by similarly situated peoples in other countries such that their overall liability from these types of cases could be in the tens of billions of dollars. And I think it makes them very nervous. As a result, in this, in this particular case, they're investing massive sums of money to try to repress it, beat it back, kill it off politically. I mean, there's been... Just stop the president. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean they, they've offered enormous payments to the government of Ecuador to kill off our case. And this is a private case. Private citizens against a private company in a judicial system where Chevron wanted the case to be held. And once the case started, you know, they've been working actively with the U.S. Embassy in Ecuador to undermine the case. It came out in WikiLeaks, uh, the Wiki Cables. They have offered um, the Ecuadorian government a sum of $700 million to settle the case without consulting with the communities. The Ecuadorian government has rejected these offers as completely inappropriate and really illegal. Um, they have, uh, you know, hired 25 or 30 lobbyists in Washington to pressure the United States government to pressure Ecuador's government to kill off the case by cutting trade preferences for Ecuador that could cost hundreds of thousands of jobs in this country, in Ecuador. Um, they play across all platforms. You know, to Chevron, the legal system is just one little area where, um, where a conflict might play out. But what they try to do is then pressure the legal system through government and investing money in oil fields and gaining power and influence such that judges and courts ultimately feel like they can't rule against them. And I think that's what they're going to try to do in all the enforcement countries. And they've done it in the United States. They've done it in Ecuador. Didn't work. They're doing it in Argentina, Brazil. And I believe there, there's activity in Canada that suggests they're doing it. But I think in the end of the day, it's not going to work. I think judges are going to do their duty and be independent and make sure this company doesn't get away with this abusive litigation strategy. They've got one further layer that, that, that I suspect me is really vile. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my, it's my understanding that they've gone to one of these horrible trade tribunals outside to yes. get a ruling that says if Ecuador ever does have to pay, Ecuador will then have to yeah. return anything yeah. that contributes or anything it receives. I'm not sure quite how that works, but basically nullify the judgment if the judgment is upheld. So, oh yeah. So Chevron is engaged in an impressive amount of forum shopping, meaning they keep looking for different courts to try to rule in their favor, and they, they almost never seem to win, but it drags out the litigation. So one of the things they've done is they filed an international arbitration claim against Ecuador's government trying to shift the entire cost of the cleanup to Ecuadorian taxpayers. It's a ta they want a taxpayer-funded bailout of their liability to clean up Ecuador from Ecuadorian taxpayers. That is, the very victims of their pollution, they want to pay for the cleanup. And it's subterfuge, in my opinion. I mean, basically, they, um, the whole international 
commercial arbitration system is stacked against people who don't have means and don't have resources. Um, this is a litigation between Ecuador and Chevron. The Ecuadorian communities who are the real party in interest, the most affected, people suffering and dying, do not have a right to appear before the arbitration panel. They meet in private. Everything is secret. You never know the results of their decisions. We cannot appear. It is a completely unfair process that's structured to favor private corporations over governments. And beyond that, there's really no case because those are international arbitration panels are supposed to rule on disputes, legitimate disputes between companies and governments that they do deals with to invest in those countries. They are not supposed to rule on private disputes between people and private companies that just happen to go into a civil court. The implications of the, what, the, what the private arbitration panel is doing are profound in this sense. If one was to accept Chevron's theory that Ecuador's government is responsible to clean up their mess, then the people of Ecuador who have been affected by the pollution will have no place to go. There's no rule of law. There's no court they can go to. They tried in the United States. Chevron won it in Ecuador. So they tried in Ecuador, and they started to win. And then Chevron said, uh-uh, we don't like Ecuador now. We're going to an international arbitration panel where you can't show up by rule. And they're going to be the ones to decide your case that we wanted to, be, to take place in Ecuador. I mean, the whole thing is preposterous. It's absurd, and it really has very little legitimacy and credibility. And no matter what they rule, I don't think it's going to matter that much because I'm confident that Ecuador's government will not really succumb to what is essentially a level of legal blackmail where they'll just pay Chevron what Chevron really owes. They're not going to do it. It would violate their own laws their own constitution and international law. And I think this investment arbitration panel, which I don't know how it's going to end up ruling, I just don't think it has a lot of credibility and is really going to matter to the judges in the enforcement courts in Canada, Brazil, and Argentina, and elsewhere that really have to decide whether to enforce the judgment from Ecuador's courts affirmed by Ecuador's Supreme Court. I don't think a private panel of secret arbitrators is going to impact that at all. But that's what those panels were set up to do. Of right? course, but yeah. I, think, I think that, um, you know, I just don't think it's going to work in this case for all the reasons I've outlined. I mean, this is a, what we call in the law, a sui generis situation. You know, there's never been a situation where a private arbitration panel thinks it can rule on a dispute between private citizens and a private company. These are state party investor arbitration panels. So Chevron's just trying to make up a dispute with Ecuador's government as if that's the real dispute when the real dispute has already been resolved by Ecuador's courts. I don't think it's going to work. I hope you're right. Those things scare the hell out of me. They know me. I mean, look, they did me at first, but um, I've studied that panel through and through. Um, I think they don't have a leg to stand on. I mean, it's just- I a, don't mean in this case, but I mean yeah. in general, that whole general, investor look, state look, dispute look, mechanism I, I, is horrible. Yeah, yeah, I've written about it, and I should send you an article I wrote. Um, uh, but it is a uh, private system of justice for the wealthy to avoid being held accountable by regular public court systems. It's yeah, very dangerous. Yeah, yeah it's, it really is. And, yeah. and for, reaping, for, for reaping money from governments for profits that are entirely theoretical. Exactly. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yet, all but, the governments seem to get sucked into them. I mean, here's Obama this morning talking yeah. about how he's going to do the Trans-Pacific deal, yeah. which strikes well, me as... Abominable. Yeah, it's, it's a private system of justice, these trade packs um, for the wealthy, for corporations. And, you know, there's a huge movement in the United States to block that treaty. Yeah. But, you know, the corporate class always seems to prevail with these trade treaties. And, you know, sometimes they're hard to understand. And in the host countries, uh, you know, like when Ecuador signed its treaty, I don't think the country understood the implications of what it was doing, and there's now an effort by the current government to revoke the treaties. Mm. Um, Good. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Yeah. I mean, there should be some of that. And apparently Australia has, uh, has said that they're not, they won't sign, won't sign a, uh, any treaty that has investor state arbitration in it. I didn't know I think, that. Yeah, so I'm told. Yeah. 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 No, I, yeah. I'm told lots of things, yeah. some yeah. of them are true. <laughs> you know, some but, are true, um, some yeah. are yeah. One last thing, and that yeah. is we're going to, go, going to go down and meet Pablo Fayardes, yeah. and he's going to give us a little tour of some of the affected area, right. um, which I'm both looking forward to and horrified at. Yeah. Um, 
Anything that you would particularly suggest, well, number one, anything you would particularly uh, want to note that I should ask, Pablo? Yeah. And, and is there any particular, are there any particular scenes there that you think um, would be particular? I mean, I presume he'll, yeah. he'll figure that out, but, so, um, but I guess I'm saying, any prep you would like to yeah, have for me? Sure. For them? Uh, I'd say a couple things. I mean, one is, it's important to emphasize, and you'll see this when you talk to Pablo, this is an Ecuadorian case. It's not an American case. It's not my case. I'm one of the lawyers on the team. So happens I've been working on it 20 years. Um, you know, I don't know whether to laugh or cry when I say that, but I've been working on it a very, very long time. But it is a case of Ecuadorians, and Pablo Fajardo is the lead lawyer of this case, and he's an extraordinary young man. Courageous. Was and is, right? The, the lead lawyer? Yeah. yeah. He was and is since probably 2005. Um, yeah, he, he sounds extraordinary. He grew up in the area. Um, he grew up in poverty. He uh, worked in the oil fields for maybe $50 a month when he was you know, a young adult to get money for his family. Uh, he also taught a literacy class, an adult literacy class at night through the local church. And some priests noticed his talent and pay for him to attend uh, a correspondence course, or to take a correspondence course to become a lawyer, which required him to study very hard and come to Quito one week a semester to take exams. So over several years, he became a lawyer and started working on the case when it came to Ecuador in the early 2000s. And little by little, showed that he was the smartest guy in the room who knew the people, knew the issues, and he became the lead lawyer in 2005. And, you know, but for him, I don't think the case would be in the good position that it's in today. He's an extraordinary man, and Chevron has done everything they possibly can to undermine him, attack him, um, you know, get in the way of the work he's doing, drown him in paper, threaten him. Um, and he just is, holds steadfast and is great. And, you know, there's also a huge community base out there. Mm -hmm in the Amazon, about 80 indigenous and farmer communities that meet on a regular basis in an assembly to give their lawyers direction, to be informed by their lawyers. I've had the privilege of attending some of these meetings. They're extraordinary. I mean, this is a grassroots movement of which the lawsuit is a component piece, but there's a lot going on, and it's, it's just an extraordinary accomplishment historically what the communities have done mm. through this lawsuit. The other thing I'd say is when you go out there, um, you will likely be horrified. I mean, I first went there in 1993, if you can believe it. I've, I've been there dozens and dozens, if not a couple of hundred times. And every time I go, and I was most recently there yesterday, I'm equally, if not more, horrified. It's just sitting out there, this mm -hmm. massive pollution that's visible to the naked eye. It stinks. You can smell it. There's vapors coming off these pits. And it will be there for centuries unless it's cleaned up. And while Chevron left Ecuador in 1992, the pollution they created while they operated here is still there and it's still polluting. It's still leaching into the soils and groundwater. It's still causing harm. It's causing even more harm today than it did when they were here because it has a cumulative effect on people in terms of their exposures to the toxins. So it's horrifying. And I haven't met a single person who has come down and seen it that hasn't left thinking they had some responsibility to try to help the communities down there who are living in this area. It's extraordinary. Well, everything I've read about him describes exactly the man you're describing. Yeah, he's, a, yeah. he's, a, he's an inspiration. And, you know, I've, I've worked closely with Pablo for almost 10 years now. Um, you know, we're, we're colleagues, we're collaborators. Um, I've learned a lot from him. And, you know, that's sort of part of what's interesting about, one of the interesting things about this case is the real genius of the people who are affected comes from them. You know, it's the understanding of nature and the forest and what's at stake and how they will settle for nothing less than a full cleanup and how their lawyers come from the communities and how they've aligned themselves with people in other countries like myself to broaden this into other areas of the world just because that's the only way you can hold Chevron accountable. It's a global company and it won't pay for the Ecuador judgment. And what's ended up happening is the creation of an extraordinary global network of lawyers and supporters 
um, who are trying to help these communities who are in control of their own destiny. You know, Chevron dumped, and they thought the people couldn't fight back. You know, they tried to consign them to the tr what literally was the trash heap of history. I mean, they thought this would never happen. You know, they thought they could get away with it. I mean, they planned to dump. This was not an accident. They planned this to save money. And here we are now, 50 years, almost 50 years after those decisions to dump were made, and look at the world, how it's changed. I mean, you know, the people of Ecuador who are affected by this have obtained the largest environmental judgment in civil, the history of civil, the civil justice system out of a court that, that, from a trial. And these are people, for the most part, who historically have no money. Not that they were poor, because they were very rich living in the forest, but they didn't have money. How do you do this with no money when Chevron is spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year? You know, that takes imagination and intelligence and heart, and they have it, you know, and so do a lot of other people working on this. And as a result, we are where we are. We've won. We now need to get the cleanup. That's the, I guess that's the other thing that's in the back of my mind is even with $9 billion, can you really clean it up? Well, you probably mm -hmm. need more, but you can do a, a whole lot of good cleanup yeah, yeah. for that amount of money. And um, Very it's going to take a lot of years. And actually the process of cleaning up, because there's no blueprint to cleaning up a delicate ecosystem that is affected by this much oil. There's no blueprint, there's no precedent for it. So it's gonna take a lot of smart people to come together and figure out how best to spend the resources that are gonna be available um, to clean this area up in the quickest possible way. Um, Chevron has never tried to blame Texaco. I mean, this was something done by Texaco, but Chevron bought Texaco in 2001 and had been warned by many people about this potential liability. And, you know, in the, in the excitement of a merger, pretty much ignored it, never did due diligence. And what, you know, they probably concluded that the people of Ecuador from the Amazon rainforest were just like a little nuisance, would never get to the point where they've gotten. Um, so, Chevron's problem is in buying Texaco, they own the liability. I mean, they own all the benefits, they own all the assets they got from Texaco, they also own all the liabilities. So right now, Chevron is full in, doesn't blame Texaco because they own 100% of Texaco. It's Chevron at this point. And Chevron's strategy to avoid paying for the harm that Texaco caused has caused enormous additional harm to the people of Ecuador. Um, Chevron is full in. It is, from our opinion, it is now their fault because they absorb Texaco and they're litigating this case, we believe, in an abusive manner, not respecting the rule of law, not respecting court judgments. Um, so there's no effort by Chevron to blame Texaco at this point. It's just, it's all one entity. Um, and Chevron knows that ultimately it's going to have to either take responsibility or be the entity to keep kicking the can down the road. Chevron can't pass the responsibility to Texaco because they own Texaco. It'd be like passing the buck to themselves. No, yeah, so, you know, that's not going to work. And Texaco has been absorbed into Chevron. I mean, all the assets of Texaco, all the capital is now part of Chevron. I will say this, though. Chevron has a lot of trademarks in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have achieved an embargo from an Ecuadorian court to own their trademarks, which we could potentially generate some money from to start a cleanup. Um, so it's not true that they have no assets here. They do have some, but they're very minor compared to their assets around the world, and they're not nearly enough to pay for a cleanup. But they at least allow the communities to get potentially some level of assets that they can start using to, you know, try to make, make an impact in the Amazon and clean up the damage. Yeah. I had never thought of trademarks as being an asset that you, you probably can't take out of the country, can you? It's complicated. I mean, you know, they, the trademarks generate a certain amount of money a year. You know, there's, they license them to local entities who market their lubricants and Havoline and all their products. And, uh, you know, there's a way to get that revenue. It's not a lot, but it's, it's not, it's, it's better than not, nothing. Not trivial. And yeah. also the precedent to, to show that the communities are starting to collect on the judgment is important. Pablo Fayardo and Stephen Donziger.
two lawyers whose relentless pursuit of one of the world's biggest and meanest corporations has made Chevron Toxico a landmark case in environmental law. The sad thing, of course, is that the people of the Ecuadorian Amazon, whose land, air, food and water have been hideously compromised, are still waiting for justice. And it seems inevitable that they'll be waiting a long while yet. Chevron has said it will fight the case till hell freezes over and will then fight it out on the ice. Well, since Canadians do that all the time, Chevron may have come to the right place. In connection with our Green Rights film project, the Green Interview has lately been interviewing green lawyers from around the world. Cormac Cullinan in South Africa, for example, and Mumta Ito in Britain, Michelle Maloney in Australia, Daniel Salaberry in Argentina. We'll be releasing these interviews throughout 2014. If they aren't yet posted when you see this, they soon will be. For The Green Interview and for The Green Rights Documentary Project, I'm Silver Donald Campbell.